cycles. The song said, didn't I conquer this last year? Have you ever felt like that you're going through cycles? You're like, am I still, am I still struggling with the same stuff? Do I still make the same mistakes, let the same people down in the same way? Didn't I conquer that in my 20s? And now I'm in my 30s or I'm in my 40s and I'm in my 50s and I keep looking back. Am I still struggling with this? To quote the great theologian, Britney Spears, oops, I did it again. I, I, I did it again. Said it again. I drank too much of it again. I popped the pill again. Had that anger issue again. Did it again. And we go in these cycles. And it feels like to me sometimes I'm supposed to have gotten past making the same mistakes. I'm supposed to have moved on from doing all of the same things over and over again. And sometimes I can get discouraged because of it. In fact, this past week or so, I think it was, I was, I was looking on social media. How many of you know that social media has changed who we are, how we react to things? And it's a good thing, right? I mean, we have, there's a lot of good to social media, but there's also this part of social media that does anybody else ever get at all, like, put out with social media at all, just aggravated with it, tired of it. You probably give it up every other day or so, and then you're back into it because you know there's some good. We know each other. We're in community. We can pray for each other and all that stuff. But I was reading something that stood out to me on social media. It just kind of grabbed my attention because it was a post from a pastor. And I love pastors, and I love to see what pastors have to say. But if I'm being real, this particular post, though I'm sure they meant well with it, just kind of, it kind of broke my heart. Because what the post said is it said that, hey, if, you know, we wouldn't be facing all of this anxiety as Christ followers. We, we wouldn't be going through all of this disconnection that we have with each other and during this time of pandemic and COVID. We wouldn't have all these doubts and we, we wouldn't feel all of the, the pressure that we feel if we were just the church and had been discipled correctly. In fact, what the post really boiled down to is it said, hey, if the church, and, and here's something I always like to point out, is the church is not this building, it's not the collection of churches all around our community. The church are the people who follow after Jesus. You know, you remember from, from uh, back in VBS, here's the church, here's the steeple, look inside, see all the people, right? We are the church. It said, look, if the church, though, were doing its job and discipling people the way that it was supposed to, there wouldn't be all of this anxiety and worry over the future. There wouldn't be this disconnection. There wouldn't be these times where we have questions and wonder what's going to go on next. And I read the post, and first of all, I had a couple of thoughts on it, but my first was, is, well, that's hogwash. That's what I thought to myself. It's good old-fashioned. Berkeley County hogwash, because here's the thing. It sounds good in a post, and it makes people feel maybe good if you're part of the exclusive group that is defining discipleship as those who don't go through any of those things whatsoever. But if you're someone who suffers with any of these kind of feelings of doubt or anxiety or worry or any of the things that sort of plague you during times of uncertainty, you're reading it and you just feel guilty. And I guess it also gives a chance for someone to define discipleship in a certain way, and, and it gives them a chance to feel like they are better than other people, I guess, in some way. But I just sat here and I thought, well, well good for them. They never feel any anxiousness, and, but, but I don't feel great all the time. Anybody else that doesn't feel great about everything all the time, that doesn't even feel like you're getting it right all the time, anybody else who says, I don't always feel connected with God. Remember last week we talked about with the well that there are times when I do stupid things and I clog up my own well, and then there are times when other people come and clog up the well, and there's this disconnection between me and God, and there are certainly times in my life where I don't feel connected to God the way that I want to be, and, and also there are times when I don't feel connected to people 
the way I want to. And, and, and again, I, I do things and, and, I, and I, I say things and, and I put things into the wrong perspective and I allow that flow to, to be disconnected. And so I sometimes feel that disconnection. I get a little anxious about the future. I, I have some questions that sometimes cause fear in my life. I, I feel disconnected from the people of God and from God sometimes. And I know, maybe you're joining us online right now, and the reason that you're not here in person yet could be because you are defined as a vulnerable person. Like, you, you, you have to watch where you go right now, and that can honestly bring some questions of doubt and, and, and into your mind, and you're going, well, when is it going to be the same again? And when will I be able to go back to church? And when will I be able to go into crowds and not feel uncertain about the future. And I know maybe you're joining us online and you're not here because of fear. Maybe you are here, but you're still going through fear and you're like, oh man, I hope that everything gets back to the way where I feel more comfortable. And because I have some questions sometimes about the future. You, you ever have questions about the future and what it's going to look like? And I feel a little disconnected. And what I want to do is say to you that I know you feel that way too. And here's what I want to say to you as your pastor. I, I want to tell you that I know that most of you are doing the absolute best that you can with what you have and what you've been given. And, and, and you are doing the absolute best you can with the situation that is around you and the circumstances that are around you. And I just want to let you know you're making it. You're joining us online. You're here in person. You're watching, and you're joining in and saying, God, would you move in me today? And I know that there are days when you don't have all the answers, and you don't, you don't feel like you're connected the way you want to be. But I want to say I love you. I'm proud of you of your pastor, and I'm proud to pastor this church because there are some things that all of us go through. They're cycles. I mean, think about it. The Scripture tells us this in Philippians chapter 4. It says this, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Everybody say pray. Type it in the chat. One, two, three. Pray. pray. We're supposed to pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle down on you. And it's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So I'm reading that verse, and I'm thinking about this idea that well, we're not supposed to have this anxiousness, and we're not supposed to have this worry, and we're not supposed to feel disconnected, and we're not supposed to wonder about the future, this post says. But I'm reading this verse out of Scripture and it tells us very clearly, so when we worry that we're supposed to flip the script and we're supposed to pray, that's what we're supposed to do. But let me ask you a question. How do you know to pray? Like, how do you know to pray? Well, the Bible says don't worry. Instead, shape your worries into prayers. Well, how are you supposed to shape worries into prayer? Here's what I would submit, that what the Bible is pointing out to us is that we're going to have those anxieties, that we're going to feel them, that we're going to feel worry sometimes. It's going to happen, that, that we're going to feel disconnected sometimes. It's a cycle that happens. We, we feel worried. We have anxiousness, and it's actually a signal in our lives, anxiety is, on the dashboard of our life to go, hey, hey, you, you, you're having some anxiety now. What does the Bible tell us that we should do? If we have anxiousness, we should pray. And so it says when you feel that anxiousness, you should pray. But in order to know to pray, we have to feel the anxiety. We've got to be a people that admit we are human beings. We are humans who, who are being something. And sometimes what we are being, not just what we're doing, but what we are being, what is inside of us, is an alert to tell us to pray. And so what I would actually say is that worry and anxiety is there to say, hey, instead of saying, man, I was feeling anxious, what we should say is, man, I was feeling like I needed to pray. Instead of saying, I'm still feeling anxiousness about this, even though I've prayed, 
What we need to say is, I need to pray more. Because in spite of my time in prayer, I'm still feeling some anxiousness to my spirit. It's like if you saw that you were running low on gas, you wouldn't go, oh my gosh, my car is just not efficient. It, it, hasn't, it, it, it won't run. No, you would go, no, I need to put something in it, right? And so rather than concentrating on the worry and on the anxiousness, the Bible is telling us to shape it, to form it, to allow anxious feelings uh, when we when we makes us feel worried, when, when it makes us feel like we are um, disconnected, when it puts those doubts into our lives, that we allow prayer to shape us. In fact, what I would say is this: our feelings are a thermometer for our souls. You know what a thermometer is? Is you take a temperature with a thermometer. And our feelings are a thermometer for our soul. It tells us where we are, what's happening in our lives. But our prayers are a thermostat for our soul. So you go into the house, and if you feel a little warm, you turn it down right. You want to cool off. If you feel a little cold, you want to turn the thermostat up a little bit. You want to heat up the house just a little bit. Our prayer is able to reset the temperature of our faith. Our Prayers are a thermostat of our faith. It can rise our faith. And so the Bible says that we are supposed to deal with these, but, but it's, it's a cycle because we feel anxiousness, we feel worry. And instead of feeling that, we, we, we turn it into, we catch the thought. It says, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ in 2 Corinthians. And so we take captive that thought of worry that thought of anxiety. Rather than letting it go out of control, we take it captive, and anxiousness produces prayer that produces faith. So anxiousness signals us to pray, which signals us to have an increase in our faith, and around and around we go. It's cycles, cycles. We're all in a cycle. I mean, I was thinking about it. If, if, if I... If I need to get a new church, if I need to get a church that never has any anxiousness, any doubts, any, any, any kind of disconnection whatsoever, and really, you need to get a new pastor. If you want a pastor that's always got the right answers, always says the right things, always knows exactly what's happening next, but what if together we could recognize that that's not the kind of church we are. We're the kind of church that says, hey, we all suffer in this. We don't point towards how great we are. We point towards how great Jesus is. And so when we have anxiousness and worry, it, we allow it to produce in us prayer. Going to the only one who can solve our worry, that can step into our anxiousness, and we allow the cycle to happen. We're in cycles. The song said, cycles, cycles. We're in a cycle. We're in a cycle. I guess then the question is not, are you in a cycle? I think we all are in some type of cycle right now. The question actually is, are you in a cycle of sin or a cycle of change? That's really the key, right? Are we in a cycle of sin? Which if we look at the scripture in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 tells us this. Temptation comes from our own desires. So we have desires. Satan doesn't tempt us things that we don't, with, with things that we don't desire. He, he, we have our own desires, and then there is this temptation that comes from our own desires, we, with, which entice us, the Scripture says, and drag us away, and then these desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And it's not just physical death, death. Like death of a friendship, death of a dream, death of, of our, our flow and our connection with God. Death. Death. It's desires that have gone haywire. And then we are enticed away and dragged away, the Bible says. And, and it says we, we have these sins that so easily entangle us and so easily weigh us down. There are go-to sins. We all have them. 
We judge other people's go-to sins more harshly than we judge our own, but we all have our go-to sins, and we're so easily entangled, and it goes into these sinful actions, and so we allow this moment, our desire, and it turns into this sinful action, and so we may even have a right thought or a good thought or want to say something, but yet it comes out in death speak, and so it's this death spiral, we would call it, gives way to death. It's a cycle, cycles. But there's another kind of cycle, and it's the cycle that we can hope for as followers of Jesus, and it's the cycle of change, cycle of change. In James still, when James chapter 1 still, it says this in verse 2 and 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, what is the Bible indicating here? That trouble is going to come your way. You are going to have things that you have to deal with. You are going to have things that you have to press through. You are going to have things that you have to assess and figure out what it is. And you are going to have to make a mature decision based on that. So there is trouble that is going to come your way. Consider it, this trouble, an opportunity for great joy. So there's a way that we can get to joy, the Scripture says. For you know that when your faith is tested... Our prayers are a thermostat for our faith. We turn our faith up. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So these troubles allow us an opportunity to mature in our endurance, our ability to put up with things that come our way that we don't like, can't deal with, don't think we can deal with, all those things. And so for when endurance is fully, endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, the scripture says, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, I'm not there yet. Perfect, complete, needing nothing, and you're not there yet. Perfect, complete, needing nothing. We're on a cycle, a cycle. And I want to spend the next few weeks looking at how we can get to a correct cycle. In fact, we're going to spend five total weekends in this series. This week, though, is just a setup. Everybody say it's set up. Say it online. Say set up. It's a setup. It is, I'm just setting it up. I'm, I'm kind of laying the groundwork. I'm getting things ready to build upon. And then for four weeks, we're going to look at how we can get into the correct cycle. I'm thinking a lot about this process Lately, and this, this idea, not just because of this series, but just in my own life for several years now, I've been thinking about what does this look like to be in process? What does it look like to have this idea that we are a work in progress, that we are making progress, but we are a process, and that, that there's a process that we have to go through? And as I've been thinking about that, you know, I'm a preacher, so... Everything I see and, and everything I feel and things that I, that I take part in, they, they always, there's these sermons that are always in my mind and I'm always working on a sermon series or I'm working on an idea and I'm looking for illustrations. In fact, I love to get illustrations from my kids, but I, I promised them just a few years ago that if I ever talk about um, a story from their life on stage that I will pay them $5. And so I'm real selective now about what I tell about my kids because if I even mention their names, they all come with their hand out and they're like, all right, I want my royalty check this week week. And so I only pick the good ones now, but always thinking about sermon stuff, always thinking about series. And so when I was doing that, I stumbled upon this interesting documentary. And I've told you guys before that I'm a history buff. Um, I love history. I, I like documentaries. Anybody else, any, any documentary fans in the house? I just, I like to watch a good documentary because I love to see um, the history behind a story. I love to see where it kind of plays in history. You know, I might know this event, but didn't know exactly where it played in history and how history affected it and, and its development and how it affected history. And so I love documentaries, the how and the realness of seeing um, how something is made. And so a couple of months ago, I, I, I heard about this documentary and I got a chance to watch it that was just fascinating to me. 
And it really shaped the way I'm thinking about this series and really shaped the way I'm thinking about discipleship because it was this documentary called Neat. And I know it may surprise you that I'm going to use this as an illustration for an entire sermon series, um, but it is a documentary on the history of bourbon. And so I know right, right now you're like, is he talking about bourbon and the history of bourbon in church? And so just a disclaimer, uh, this is not a you should go drink bourbon, bourbon thing. This is not a, uh, you know, anything about that. We've talked about that before. You can go back and see our views on alcohol and how we think the Bible talks about alcohol. And I'm, I'm not getting into that. I'm not talking about that during this series. But uh, uh, the process of how bourbon is made, the history behind the legislation that made it to where only in America can you make bourbon. If it's not distilled in America, it's not bourbon. And I was watching this documentary about how it played in with prohibition and how distilleries were still legally allowed to operate during prohibition and why and the effects that it had on, you know, Kentucky as a state and, and the whole United States and the rise of bourbon and the fall of bourbon. It was just fascinating documentary to me. And then to watch the process, the process, because this documentary gave all of this idea of the process, years in the making, that it goes through for this distillation process. It was a, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. And, and so it got me really looking in even more into this idea of distillation and the history of it and how we came to know how to distill things. Because it's very fascinating to me. I mean, we distill something. We take it. And for example, one of the very first things we ever distilled as a, as a, you know, in the whole process was water. And so you, you take water that's salt water, and you want to remove the salt from it, right? And so they figured out how to evaporate out the water and then turn it back into water and move it over into another place where it was palatable and it was drinking. And I'm watching that, and it's fascinating to me because I love the sciences. I'm not really, never was really good in science and don't do, don't do a lot with understanding it, but I love the fact that there was someone who figured that out. Have you ever looked at all the advances in technology and all the things that we have and the way we do things and what we do and go, someone had to figure that out at some point. Like, like we know which mushrooms to eat and which ones not to eat anymore, right? And how'd they figure that out? I don't know. I guess some two guys were like, all right, you eat that one, I'll eat this one. One of us will live and we'll tell the story, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know how we figured that out. And we figured out how to get radio waves through the air. Does it still amaze anybody that they, they can put, you know, a, 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 they can talk to a phone, and somewhere on the other end, it's traveled through air, and they're hearing you on the other end, and you can take a picture or take a video, and it can travel through air, and all of a sudden, there's a video of you on the other end. How did they figure this out? And so, it's fascinating to me, and so as I dug deep into this process of distillation and we distill so many things. I mean, water, obviously, we talked about bourbon. We talked about now, perfume. If you're wearing perfume or cologne right now, it's distillation process that happens. Gasoline, xylene, alcohol, paraffin, kerosene. Um, there's all kind of liquids that are distilled. We, gas, you can, we even grab out of the air like nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and they're grabbed and distilled out of the air. And it's, it's incredible to me. How did someone know to do that? And we're reading about the, I was reading about the process and this distilling process really fascinated me, but it also, I saw that there was this great correlation between distilling these cycles that we go through and discipleship. In fact, when I was working on this series in my mind several months ago, I had uh, kind of initially named it create, how to create a disciple. And, and I was thinking about it, that's really how we think about it, isn't it? Because that was my first thing I wrote in, how, do you, how to create a disciple. I'm going to talk about how do we create a disciple. What does it look like? What is a disciple? How does it form? But I thought we really think that, that there's like a creation. That one day you were, you know, who you were, and then the next day you're everything that God wants you to be. Boom, there was this creation. And as I was thinking more about it and thinking about distillation, I was like, no, no, no. It, is, it looks a lot like distilling a disciple. How do we go from being someone who is very much everything that God wants me to be? 
Like everything that God wants me to be is right here, right now. God made me that in an instant at my creation and then at my salvation. He redeemed it and I am everything I need to be right now. And yet there is still parts of me that aren't good for who I want to be. There are still things that I have to go through a process and it's, it's painful. It's painful to be called out. It's painful to be told that hurt. And the way you said that, the way you did that, it hurt. It's painful to live through the process of going, didn't I conquer this last year? It's painful to admit I'm, I'm anxious. It's painful to admit I feel disconnected. And, and I think oftentimes in our faith, we can see our salvation as just an event. Now, let me say, it is an event. There is a time and a place where we go, God, I'm going to allow you through Jesus to save me, and we all need to do that. But it's also not just that event. In fact, the Scripture tells us this. It says, my dear friends, you always obeyed when I was with you, Paul says. Now that I am away, you should obey even more. And then he tells them, how are you going to do this? Obey, obedience comes. It's a cycle. You always obey, but you still need to obey. You're going to have to work some things out, Paul is saying. He says, so work with fear. Other translations say work out your salvation. He says, so work with fear and trembling to discover what it really means to be saved. In theological terms, we would actually call this progressive sanctification. In other words, I am saved, and I'm, on the, I'm in the process of being sanctified, but I am not yet sanctified. And so I'm going to have to take steps. I'm in cycles. I'm in a process. I'm going to do my next step. And then I'm going to realize there are still toxins and things in me and a part of me. And so I'm going to take another step. And then I'm going to realize there's some more things I need to work on. And then I'm going to take another step and another step. It's a process. It, 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 we take progress. We make progress, but it's a process. In fact, Jesus said like this. He said to the crowd in Luke chapter 9, if any of you wants to be my follower, what, what is a disciple? A follower of Jesus. If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Daily. Every single day day, decision after decision to choose to be more like Jesus, meaning anything that is in me, anything that is attached to me, the sin that so easily entangles me, I want to lay it aside, strip it off, as the scripture says, every single day making a decision to be more and more like Jesus. It is a process. Say process. It's a process. Not done in an instant, but I'm everything that I need to be. It's just the fact that God needs to bring it out of me, and it's going to take a process. How to distill, how to distill a disciple. And I was looking at that verse. What is it that we're actually doing when we're distilling? We are putting some things away. We're putting some things to death, you might could even say. And Jesus said we are to take up our what? Our cross daily. And so if we're taking up our cross daily and every day, why would we have a cross? Why did Jesus say we need to take up our cross? Well, Jesus went to the cross to do what? Answer me. He went to the cross to what? Die. To die. Yeah. And so the Bible is pointing out to us that we're going to have to every single day be reminded through an instrument of death that there are some things inside of us, attached to us, around us that will need to be put to death through this discipleship distilling process. We distill a disciple. Michelangelo famously said of the process of carving some of the most unbelievable, incredible art that our world has ever known in the incredible statues that he carved. He said this. He said, I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved until I set him free. 
And through the discipleship process, every single day, every single moment, every single correction, every single pain, every single process, it's the process. Through the discipleship process, God looks at us and goes, at our moment, when we say, would would you save me? He redeems us. And he looks at us and goes, I see everything in the marble. And now I'm just going to carve until I set it free. I'm, I'm going to chip away a little bit by a little bit. I, I, you don't need to pretend and perform that you've got it all together. You don't need to do that. You just, you need to realize that there are parts of you that I'm going to want to still work on. And, and I may, every single chip away makes you look more like the end result that I want to take you towards. Every single chip and brokenness is getting you closer and closer to being like Jesus. And so that allows us to reframe it. How do I count it all joy that I get to go through the chiseling process, the trouble? I count it all joy because I realize that every single time there's a little piece of me taken away that's not like Jesus, that what is left looks more and more like him. And so I go through pain, pain that I cause on myself. And I go, God, thank you for taking that away from me. Thank you for redeeming that. Thank you, thank you that, that when I see that now in my own life, I'm not ashamed of it, but I realize what it was because shame doesn't take us anywhere. I realize what it was, and I'm, I go, God, I'm not, I don't want to be like that anymore. And so you're, you're, you're chipping away. You're removing so that we can get to where we need to get to. I, I was reading about the distillation process in a scientific journal, and they were talking about how this all happens. And, uh, you know, they got really deep, way deeper than, than I could get about the molecular structure of things and, you know, how some things have different boiling points and why they have those different boiling points and how we can take advantage of those boiling points and manipulate things to be able to pull one thing out of another thing, leaving behind two separate things, but leaving one thing behind. But I love this statement that I read. It said, the core of a distillation process, everybody say process, it's a process. The core of a distillation process is selective evaporation. That just jumped out at me, selective evaporation. That's really what discipleship is. It's selective evaporation. Because I am who I am, but there are some things attached to me and around me that need to be evaporated so that we can move who I really am over to one spot, leaving behind the things that I used to be. And so I'm selecting, I want to take this with me, but I don't want to take that with me. And so that takes honesty, being able to go, hey, I'm going to have some self-awareness about where I am. The scripture says it like this, search me, try me, show me if there's anything in me that's not like you, God. So, So I say, now what do I need to leave behind? What do I need to have chiseled off? It's selective evaporation. That reminds me of John 3.30. Because it kind of points out selective evaporation. It says, hey, he, Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. I'm going to decide that these things that, that are in my life that aren't honoring to God, aren't honoring to the people around me, that, that I've allowed to attach to me, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Call them what they are, and they are pieces and parts of me that need to be distilled away. But I was thinking about the scripture, it says, to strip away all of those things that so easily entangle you in Hebrews. Uh, I was thinking about the fact that molecular, you're reading about the molecular breakdown and stripping away molecule by molecule to go from one thing, taking it out of what is one thing and separating it into another. And I was reminded that sometimes the process is painful. That sometimes the process, it, it, it doesn't feel like something I want to go through. It's a cycle. It's, it's selective evaporation. So it says, 
the core of a distillation process, is selective evaporation and condensation of particular components. But then listen to this statement. This is out of a scientific journal about distillation, but think about it from a discipleship standpoint. We must allow many, many cycles of evaporation and condensation that take place. That's why in bourbon, for example, they're double and triple and quadruple, and I don't know how you say five like that, but syncolatoy or something, I don't know. There are all these, there are all these cycles, cycles. And so we don't get frustrated when we're going through the cycle again. We go, have I, have I kicked off some more of it than last time? If I have, do I have less anxiety today than I had yesterday? And if I, and that, what does that tell us? Anxiety, I need to pray. Am I praying more than I prayed yesterday? It's a cycle. It's, it, it's a cycle. And so Romans 12, 2 reminds us that, because this is what's happening to us. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform. Metamorphi is the Greek word there. Let God transform you. What is metamorphi? Metamorphosis. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Oh, man. How many times have our, our, our cycles right here above our chins? Oh, right here. Just moving around cycle after cycle after cycle. Let him transform to a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's a, there's a will for you that is good and pleasing and perfect. There is a place where you will distill all of the things that are not good and pleasing and perfect, and you will get to a place where it's good and pleasing and perfect. So to truly transform, to truly be able to be discipled into what God would have for you, you will have to leave behind the sin that so easily entangles you. It's your go-to sin. You know, and we judge everybody else's go-to sin so harshly, but we don't oftentimes see our own. So you've got to see the sin that dwells in you. And so that means then that you have to first admit that you have sin in the first place. So you can't pretend and perform and act like, oh, I've made it to this place. Remember, the Apostle Paul said he hadn't even made it. He said, I haven't made it. I've got some stuff I'm working on. We all have some stuff we're working on. It's sin, but you got to first acknowledge the sin in you. I think for many of you, you haven't acknowledged sin at all in your life. You've tried to say you want to be a better person. You've tried to say, I'll work harder at it. But you haven't acknowledged it as sin. Romans 3.23, for I all have sinned. All. Everybody say all. I just want you to realize that's you and me. That's, that's everybody in the whole world that's ever existed. All. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God gave us a way to be forgiven of our sins. So we acknowledge that there's sin. But God says, but, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That verse has always been one that takes me to my knees. It humbles me. But it's also one that just reminds me of how good and gracious our God is. He, he didn't say, hey, get yourself cleaned up and then you can come and talk to me. Hey, get out of that cycle and then, then we can have a conversation. I mean, what? He, he doesn't come and go, you're, you're still struggling with that? Hey, man, you deal with that stuff and then we'll talk. No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All of us have sinned. But Christ died for all of us. So then it says in Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth, acknowledge, admit, confess that you're a sinner, the Lord Jesus, to the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, 
listen to this, you will be saved. There, there is no discipleship process without first allowing Jesus to save you. And trying to go through the process of becoming someone who is more and more like Jesus when you haven't even gotten to a relationship with Jesus is out of order. And so, yes, we believe in discipleship, but we also believe that when Jesus said, go and make disciples, the very idea of making a disciple is this new creation that we become when we allow Jesus to save us. And so it says, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And there, there's such good news for all of us. Because we all are in cycles. We all are in the same boat. Nobody gets a free pass. Oh, I was just born into a Christian family. No, no, no. But the good news is, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We have an opportunity to allow Jesus to save us. And as he saves us, he begins to restore things in us. And he takes us through the cycle. But I, I, would, I would not be a good pastor. I would not love you enough if I tried to tell you to go into the next four weeks and didn't say, but have you allowed Jesus to save you? Have you had that moment, that event? Yes, there's a progress and there's a process. But have you had that moment where you didn't try on your own and it wasn't religion and it wasn't church and it wasn't what you could accomplish and it wasn't what your grandmother accomplished or your mother or your family, it wasn't anything. It was just you and Jesus going, help. Because I can't make it without you. I can't make it without you saving me. See, we don't have anything to do with our salvation except for the very moment that we say, Jesus, I want to allow you to do what only you can do to save me. And I believe that watching us online right now, joining us here right now, I just believe in my spirit that there's many of you have never done that. You've heard about it. You, you've, you know what it means, but you've really just tried other things. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer in just a moment. And we're all going to pray this prayer together because I don't believe that anyone should ever have to take this step and pray alone. So every single person online, I want you to pray out loud. Every person joining us here, pray out loud. And we're going to pray this prayer. But there are going to be some of you, and you'll know this in your own spirit, who are choosing to pray this prayer for the very first time. You may have walked down an aisle before. You may, you may have even prayed a prayer before, but you're going, but I don't, I don't think I really submitted my life to him to save. So would you all just pray out loud with me, praying with those who are among us who are praying this for the first time. Say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on a cross and he rose from the grave to forgive me of my sins. So I give you my sins and I give you my shame and I'll follow you for all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, I know that some of you online uh, prayed that prayer for the very first time. I know that some of you here in our auditorium prayed that prayer for the very first time. And I just want you to be brave. I want to ask you to allow us to celebrate with you. Online, would you just kind of indicate by saying, hey, I prayed the prayer, or maybe put a hand emoji or something online in the house. Would you just raise your hand on the count of three? If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, just like many prayed it before you, would you just raise your hand on three? One, two, three. Would you raise your hand up in the air if you prayed that prayer? For the very first time, amen. So proud of you online. Online right now, we've got a link that I would love for you to click and just indicate to us and let us know. We want to get you some more information all around our auditorium. 
there are QR codes, and you can just shoot your camera, add that QR code, and that a form will come up. We would love to know about you, and we want to reach out to you. But in addition to that, we've got some Bibles for you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you just pick up a Bible? Someone to be there to smile at you and socially distance, of course, to tell you and give you the gift of the Bible. And we want to hear more from you. You can also go to the help desk and just get more information. We've got a couple of next steps for you. Next weekend, we have a perfect next step for everybody who has prayed that prayer but hasn't taken the step. We believe it's obedient to Jesus to do this, that you need to take the next step of baptism. And so for some of you next weekend, you need to be baptized. Why do we get baptized? Because Jesus told us to. It's an obedience to him, and it is a symbol to the world of the decision we have made. But we've got a lot of next steps that we'd love for you to take. And honestly, here, here's one of the best ones you can take. Come back next week. Because we're going to take the four, next four weeks, and we're going to talk about the sometimes difficult but always rewarding cycle of change. How, how do we strip away the sin that's so e easily entangles? How do we do that? How, how do we become more mature in our faith? How do we do that? How do we make different decisions tomorrow than we made today? Because you know what? Jesus has a plan for you, and you are no longer sinners. The sin is just something that needs to be stripped from you. But if you prayed that prayer or have ever prayed that prayer before and asked Jesus to save you and allowed him to save you, you are now more than a conqueror. You are a champion. You are someone that he is working on and has something he wants to create in you. And so as we continue to respond to what's going on today, will we, will we just allow Jesus to move in us? God, we thank you. We want to respond to you now in worship. We want to praise you. We want to be a part of everything that, God, you want for us. And so, God, we ask you now that you would continue to work in us, that you would work through us. In Jesus' name, amen.